So the first thing I want to clear up is uh, a welcome to Atlanta. This is my hometown. Uh, you guys should know that I am not Seth Rogen. Um, a lot of people get us confused, uh, but we're not the same person, although I don't think we've ever been seen in the same place. Uh, my background comes a little bit more from change type stuff. Uh, back in the day, about 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years ago, um, uh, I did what everybody, every young liberal in their 20s did, which was uh, basically pack their bags and move to Vermont and go work for um, this guy, uh, Howard Dean. I was his lead programmer in 2004 um, and I built a lot of the online infrastructure behind that campaign and then obviously uh, Ah, happened, um, and that campaign sort of imploded, uh, but uh, as a result of that, um, lots of people were impressed with what we did on the campaign um, and wanted to hire uh, the Dean's web team, and so I founded this company, Blue State Digital, who then got the attention of this guy, and we built this website, which was really cool, but partisan politics wasn't really for me. So I went to go work at the Sunlight Foundation, uh, figured out um, government transparency, led Sunlight Labs, and said, hey, you know what, open source developers have a role in their government. Maybe we can use open source technology to actually open up the way government works rather than worrying about the way that politics works. Let's worry about the way that government works. Um, but ran into a guy in front of the White House who held a sign over his head that said, keep your government hands off of my Medicare. Tried to explain to him that Medicare is a government-run program and that would be logically impossible. Um, and uh, so then I came up with an idea to say, hey, maybe not only do we need to work on the way that government releases information, but maybe we need to work on critical thinking skills and how... Um, how <laughs> how people uh, receive this information. So I wrote this book called The Information Diet. Then after that, I got a call from the White House, which landed me this awesome picture. Um, uh, I became a Presidential Innovation Fellow. Um, it also landed me this awesome track jacket. Um, and, uh, and went and worked inside of the White House for a while. And the thing out of that entire career that I can't figure out is how did this website cost three million dollars. It cost about three million dollars to make over the course of two years. And keep in mind, this is a high-scale website. It's a lot of stuff. How did this website cost about three million dollars? And this website cost three hundred million dollars. And so that's sort of the thing I'm on. And I think it's probably natural to think that it's it's, it's, you know, uh, power-hungry members of Congress with mustache-whirling lobbyists that are doing this stuff. And we can always think of, you know, these mustache-whirling villains in the back rooms uh, that, that are, you know, locking people out and that kind of thing. But I don't think that that's true. My, ex my experience in government is that it's not mustache-whirlers. It's, it's convoluted systems. This is the procurement process of the federal government in just one particular part, the Department of Defense's uh, uh, innovation and uh, acquisition logistics program. It's absolutely crazy, but it's this kind of system, not mustache twirling lobbyists, um, that enabled only 16 people to be able to bid on healthcare.gov, 16 giant companies that were awarded contracts in 2007 before the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act passed, and it's this kind of system that uh, 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 enabled CGI Federal to lobby for the passage of the bill before they were awarded the contract. And this has gotten me thinking that maybe the way that government, our government, the government that we pay taxes to and we vote for, isn't doing a particularly great job at managing and implementing technology. And if you start scratching the surface around that, things get a little bit scary. So we all know this curve, this is Moore's Law. It's just an exponential growth curve that I made up. There's, it's not you know, actual transistors or anything like that. It's just you know, uh, 2x in a, in, a, in a spreadsheet over time. Um, uh, but if you think about if there's a drag in the way that government acquires this technology, then there's going to be an exponential gap between what the public sector and the private sector has. And it sort of looks like this. Um, 
And this gets kind of scary because obviously we start seeing weird things start to happen and an expectations gap appear between what the public sector has and what the private sector has. You can see this if you walk into the Department of Motor Vehicles, you can sort of start looking at the software that they're using or the computer that they're, they're using and going, hey, wait a minute, this is, is this 2002 or is this 2014? Um, you, you can see this in, in, the, um, in, the, in the actual hardware on people's desktops. If you walk into a, a desk, if you walk into a uh, IT office inside of the federal government, you'll often find two desktops on a, on a machine. You'll see one desktop, like all in one computer, um, uh, that was probably purchased in 2006, and that computer's job is to, uh, I, as far as I can tell, is to d display a screensaver um, of a seal of the agency uh, that you're in. And then next to it is usually a MacBook Pro, um, and that, that computer's job is to do the work of the, of, of, of the person who's sitting there in front of you. And, you know, if you fast forward a few years, you'll find that government employees are carrying two phones in their pockets. They're carrying an iPhone in their left pocket that they bought or an Android that they bought that's, you know, roughly about six to eight months old. And then in their right pocket, they're carrying a BlackBerry that was purchased for them by their agency in 2007 um, that they want to run over uh, with a truck. And then... Um, if you forward, you know, if you fast forward this a little bit, like what happens when Siri starts to work, right? Or, or, uh, or, or some form of artificial intelligence starts to work, um, but the government can't get access to it. A couple of years back, for instance, uh, I think this was in 2009, the Dow uh, crashed by a thousand points. Um, and it was because of a computer glitch in, um, in uh, high frequency algorithmic trading. Um, that now represents about 30% of all trades on the stock market is, is in algorithmic trading. So how can financial regulators actually keep up with that high frequency algorithmic trading if they can't access the same kinds of computational capacity that those traders uh, are, are, um, <coughs> are installing? So I think you can also see this inside of the legislative branch of government. Uh, who recognizes this building? Everybody recognize this building? Let's do a little thought experiment here. Um, I want you to put your hands uh, in front of you like this, okay? And uh, I just want you to clap once if you think that this institution does a good job of listening to the American public. Just clap one time. All right, so that was a test to see if there are any lobbyists here. Um, <laughs> we're cool. Um, so uh, you guys are in, are, are in pretty good company. Most of the country now uh, does not have a lot of faith in Congress. Um, we, uh, we think that as a, as a general idea that Congress uh, doesn't listen to us, that they won't listen to us, that they would rather listen to lobbyists and, and mustache twirlers uh, and smoke-filled back rooms. But uh, that's just not the case. It's not the case, if you look at it through this lens of technology and open source, it's not the case that Congress won't listen. It's that they can't listen. And this is a scalability problem. Just as healthcare.gov was a scalability problem, this is a scalability problem. But it's not a scalability problem of technology. It's a scalability problem of democracy. Let me explain to you what I mean. Uh, when this country was founded, uh, there was one member of Congress for every 60,000 people. Uh, so that's what this ratio uh, sort of looks like. The yellow guy at the top is your member of Congress. Each person there looks like 100 people. It's pretty easy to represent. In about 1915 or so, we passed a law that limited the number of members of Congress to 435. And so now this is what the ratio looks like. This is not a bug. The member of Congress is the black pixel in the center. Um, and it's a preposterous notion to think that a member of Congress can do a good job when they're representing around 717,000 people. You try representing 717,000 people and demonstrating to them that they're listening to you, or you're listening to them. It's, I think it's functionally impossible, especially when you think about the level of technology that they have available to them. 
So if you think about the ratio of representatives to population, our ratio is way off of everybody else's, every other established democracy. And granted, our population is also quite larger than any other G8 country, but still, our ratio is way off. But more importantly, this is nation builder. This is technology that it takes to get elected. This is the kind of technology that you use to listen to your constituents. Or MailChimp is another great piece of technology to listen to and send out messages to your constituents. It is fantastic software just like Nation Builder. Um, but once you get elected and the rules start applying to what it is that you can buy and who you can buy from, this is what the technology looks like. And so how can we be expected to run a functional democracy where citizens have access to great tools to send messages to Congress, but the messages that Congress has to receive those tools look like this? I should note also that Nation Builder costs about $20 a month, and this costs about $2,000 per month per user. Now, some enterprising people in here ought to be thinking by now, how do I get a piece of that action? <laughs> um, another part of this that we have to understand is that throughout the, 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 uh, the course of American history, Government has always been part of and an early adopter of technology. That its ability to adopt the internet is slow is an anomaly. Government dragged the first Morse, uh, Morse code line, the first telegraph line. It really helped build the first railroads. It, um, uh, 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 it established the, the, and invested in radio technology very early on. It built um, highways to enable automobiles, these crazy horseless carriages. Um, it regulated uh, very early on, before the TV actually came out, it regulated TV airwaves and, um, and uh, eventually commercialized television as well as the airlines. And then this pesky computer came out and power truly got pushed to the people and we ended up with this pesky Moore's Law thing that's created this expectations gap between us and the, and, the, and, the, uh, uh, and the government. And that's why I think that this website, this $300 million website that failed, isn't a sign of a technology scaling problem, it is a sign of a democracy scaling problem and it scares the bejesus out of me. Because at some point, I'm going to be flying around in a jetpack, and it's going to be very hard for the cops to catch me in their Buick. <laughs> Actually, that doesn't scare me at all. Um, so, yeah, I want to take, take a look at why this is happening, and why we are in a, why, why and how we got in this space now. I think the first thing that we have to think of is ourselves, is about who we vote, who we vote for. To counter the mustache twirlers, we tend to look towards Moseses, people who want to put a chicken in every pot, people who promise us freedom and opportunity and equality and prosperity, people who say, let me get behind the wheel of this car and I will take you to the promised land. What we don't hire who we don't hire as voters are mechanics. We don't hire people that say, hey, let me take a look at the car and make sure that it works. Because if we did hire mechanics, people like us, by the way, if we did hire mechanics as voters, mechanics would say, hey, wait a minute, the engine of this vehicle looks like this and the car looks like this. We are never going to get to the promised land in this vehicle. Modern engines look like this and modern cars look like this. But we end up in these closed systems, absolutely closed door systems, which prohibit competition from getting in. And they make it so that only 16 companies can, can bid on contracts. We have websites like SAM.gov in the federal space that require you to go through an 80-step process to be even eligible to bid. I just, I just registered my company on SAM.gov. It required me three different browsers to get, th get through the process because of all of the JavaScript compatibility errors. And in fact, since they launched this SAM.gov website, um, uh, new entity registrations have been reduced by half. That means, effectively, an IT implementation has cut off the ecosystem of available contractors to the federal government by half. 
just an IT bug that no one seems to care about. And when we talk about IT in the federal space, in the governmental space as a whole, let me just give you an idea of how much money that is. That's $180 billion. Now, $180 billion is a hard number to think about, so let me add it up for you. If you take the annual operating costs of Google, Microsoft, and Apple and add them up, it is not as big as what government spends on IT. So all of the catered meals and, and, and private bus lines and all of that fancy stuff that uh, our IT companies spend um, doesn't come up, uh, doesn't, it, I mean, it comes close, but it doesn't exceed the amount of money that the federal government spends on information technology. Not the federal government, all governments combined in the United States spend on information technology. That is an amazing amount of money that we should be getting a higher return on. And we shouldn't just be getting a functionality return on it, but our, um, our legislative code requires, who here thinks that there should be more women in technology? Just clap your hands. Great, thank you. Um, uh, and there should be more women here. Uh, the, uh, the Small Business Administration runs a women in technology uh, 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 program. The problem is, is that you have to write an essay in order to be part of it. How, why on earth would you require a woman to, to, to write an essay about how she is a woman? <laughs> like, how does, that, how does that even work? The same, same goes, who here thinks that there should be more minorities in technology? I hope the same number of people clap, if not more. Um, same thing goes. You have to, it, takes a, it takes eight months. So if these systems, if you're, gonna, if you're, if you're a small business uh, running a uh, consulting shop, are you seriously going to spend six months registering with the Small Business Administration, or are you going to go generate billable hours? These processes can be made easier, and we can finally start lowering the barriers to entry and leveling the playing field a bit. Same goes with veterans. We are a country that put a man on the moon. We ought to be able to build a website that supports multiple stab tabs. <laughs> we, in order to fix this problem, I think there are lots of ways that, that we can... Um, we can look at this. One model is uh, the UK. The, the, in in uh, uh, a few years back, I think it was 2010, uh, the UK spent 12 billion dollars on their healthcare.gov, their IT rollout, their um, uh, of of uh, the, their modernization of the the National Health Service, and um, it failed. It failed completely. Um, it was a total disaster. And so what they said was, we're going to have to manage this in a, a radically different way because we just can't do this. And remember, the UK is not quite as big of a country as the United States, and so $12 billion, while it's a lot of money to us, is a huge amount of money to them. Um, and so they centralized information technology in a cabinet-level office called the Government Digital Service and said, we're going to hire some smart people and have a first choice inside of government that says, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this internally. Um, and we're going to compete with those external contractors and hopefully boost the level uh, uh, of competition that we have. And the, thing, the other thing they did is they said, we're going to be accountable to the public in all ways. We're going to put all of our metrics online. We're going to say to the public how much we're spending, who we're paying, how we're hiring, and how our performance metrics are going up. Um, in Estonia, they, uh, they, they said, we're going to build a digital government from the start. So we're going to build an open platform uh, for what's the first thing that a government needs to do? The first thing that a government needs to do is verify that you are you. If we create an authentication layer at the base layer of government, then we can create an entire digital government on top of that. But the first thing we've got to nail is an authentication layer. So at birth, everyone gets a, 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 a key pair um, in Estonia. And they made that key pair system open for everybody. Um, and what that's done is it's created a uh, contractual way for businesses to enter, interoperate because you know that you are you. You can prove that you are you to external entities via the internet. And it's created a way for all digital services to be maintained online. Now, these are incredible things that are happening uh, in the United States as a result of healthcare.gov. Um, they created this uh, organization inside of the General Services Administration called 18F. Um, I, have a competitive organization called 36M. Um, 
Um, but uh, no, they, they created this organization called 18. I can't pass that joke up. I just can't pass it up. Um, I've really got to start passing that joke up. Um, 18F is, a, is an organization. There's about 20 people that work there now. They've hired uh, smart people um, to come and say, hey, why don't you be a technologist inside of government, and we're going to work on, on small innovation projects. They created the Presidential Innovation Fellowship Program that I was part of that said, hey, why don't you come in for six months to a year and help us figure things out and then get lost. So I led a program called RFPEZ, and what RFPEZ said was, hey, instead of making someone wade through uh, 500 pages of documentation to figure out how to bid on a contract, how about if we put a button somewhere that says, bid now, um, and, and people could click on that, and then they could fill out a form and submit their bid. What happened here was sort of miraculous. We ran five procurement contracts through that, and it reduced the cost of all of those contracts by 30%. 30% by, not, I mean, this isn't rocket science. You guys would have done the same thing. Just put a bid now button there, and, it, and, and boom, 30%. It's crazy. Um, this 18F organization, they are using open source. Um, they have a GitHub account. Um, you can see what it is that they're doing and what it is that they're up to. And if you think about this from a moral level, from an American level, shouldn't all government source code be open since we pay for it? Um, this should not be novel, right? This should be the status quo, uh, that, what it is that, we're, that what it is that we are funding as taxpayers should be available to us. And that goes the same for, you know, uh, the source code as it does for academic research, as, as it does for everything else that the federal government funds. It ought to be, it ought to belong by default to the public. Um, so my, my overall point here is... In order to get to the promised land, we can no longer drive cars like this. It, it should no longer be acceptable for us to, to, um, to, to, to be passengers in this kind of car. And in order for us to change that, we've got to stop worrying about finding Moses. <laughs> we've got to stop worrying about Frank Underwood. Um, and, and the mustache twirling lobbyists in the, in, the, in the back room closets. And we, and by we, I don't mean the American people. By we, I mean us, engineers, programmers, people who understand systems. We, the people in this room, have got to start combating this. Designing better systems. Systems that m manage the way that the federal government works better. Because if you think about it, all the, 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 um, the, the law books are, it's just a different kind of code, right? It's just, it's just software. Um, it's a set of rules, a set of logic that says how we human beings ought to operate. It's no different than, I mean, I'd probably say it's, you know, it's like PHP, kind of can't understand uh, how, why it's structured in certain ways. Some of the definitions are off, um, but, uh, but, you know, it's getting there. Um, and the way that we combat these systems, the way that we improve these systems is not by getting a bunch of experts in a room to say, well, let's tweak some things, let's design these things. The way that we fix this system is by being open. It's by opening it up. It's by opening up markets to competition. It's by opening up the regulatory process to public comment. It's by opening up the way that uh, people participate with their members of Congress. Um, it's by making it so that members of Congress can buy tools that allow for people to that allow for them to listen to the public better. It's by being open. The only way that you beat a closed kludgy system is by opening it up. That, at least that's the only way I know how to do it. But in order for us to do that, we have to accept our role as mechanics. We have to say, hey, wait a minute. We, in this room, we engineers <laughs> are the, the new mechanics of democracy. In every, throughout human history, there's always been a class of people, always been a class of people, that have a, uh, a, a more substantial role over democracy, um, over the way that their government works, than others. <laughs> Um, in the Egyptian times, it was scribes. It was people literally who were literate. You know, they, they literally literate. They were people who knew how to read and write because most people did not know how to read and write. 
And so they had power because they could do science and technology and engineering and math, and they could build pyramids. And Imhotep, one of the uh, first scientists and engineers, he was, uh, consider- he was elevated to God status because basically he could read and write. Um, Forward, forward it down the road to the founding of this democracy. We had people who were specialists in the legal profession, who were hyper-literate people, who could speak the law, who could design these rules, and they were, in fact, a set of people who established a new kind of democracy. But in order to scale this democracy up, I think that it's up to us, a new set of hyper-literate people, hyper-literate engineers who can build responsible, open systems. So I hope you, I hope you think about that, and I hope you... Maybe think about taking up this mantle of saying, hey, why don't I dig a little bit deeper this election year, this midterm, and instead of worrying about the sports of politics, I'm going to worry about the management of government. I'm going to worry about how my local community works. I'm going to worry about how the city of Atlanta procures uh, for information technology. By the way, they suck at it. (laughs) Um, I'm going to worry about how the the county of DeKalb or the county of Fulton County uh, does this stuff. I'm going to worry about why is it that the tax assessor wants me to, 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 to sign this PDF and send it in? Can't they put a form on the internet? That is, that is 2002 level technology. Come on. So I want you to worry about that and I want you to think about that and think about the impact that that can have on your neighbors and on your community. Taking up this mantle of saying, hey, we, <laughs> we to quote Barack Obama, we're the ones that we've been waiting for. We just didn't know it was us. Um, uh, and think about how you can impact your community through your professions. Uh, Thanks a lot. I'm not Seth Rogen. Uh, I'm Clay Johnson, and uh, you guys have been absolutely wonderful. I can answer questions if you'd like or um, all kinds of other things um, because I'm ending about 10 minutes early. I th- so the question is, you know, I talked about the scale of, of large democracy being a problem. What do I think about small um, uh, local uh, government or distributed government being, um, being an answer to that? Um, so I'm going to answer your question with a uh, data visualization, a human data visualization. All right. Uh, everybody stand up for a second. Let's all stand up. Okay. Now, stay standing if you can name the President of the United States. Awesome. Stay standing if you can name both of your senators in the state that you live in. Stay standing if you can name your member of Congress. All right, take a look around the room. This is really sad. Stay standing if you can name your mayor. All right, people. All right. Let's, now let's go for the tough one. Stay standing if you can name your state representative. <laughs> Lee. You don't have a state representative. You live in the District of Columbia. Sit down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, stay standing if you name your city councilman. Wow. All right. So three, pe- three, four, five, six, six people out of 600, seven people out of 600. Uh, that's sad. Uh, everybody can sit. So the problem here is that that is a novel effort, and it's something that I, I agree with. Uh, I think that paying more attention to local government than state government uh, and federal government is an important thing. The problem is what I just showed is... People can't even get below. People, for some reason, know who the president is. We lost about, I don't know, 20% of the audience with senator. And we lost another 20% at least with representative. Um, and by the time we got to mayor, at least you know, 70% of the people were sitting down in this room. And so until we get there, that, that to me demonstrates that we're paying a heck of a lot of attention to politics that's far away from us. That's a a lot about what my book is about. Um, 
is this idea that, you know, maybe we ought to think about the ballot box and, and the way that we print out ballots. Maybe we ought to turn them upside down, right? Maybe we ought to put our local elected officials at the top and put the president at the bottom. Because if you think about it, your city council person impacts your life a hell of a lot more than the president of the United States does. I have this hole in my sidewalk in front of my house, and man, the Atlanta city, count, uh, uh, the Atlanta city ordinances around sidewalks make me nuts. Um, but the, the, I, I, I can't get it fixed. I can't get it I mean, I talked to my city councilman, I, I, uh, who's Alex Juan, I know my city councilman, um, and, uh, and I just can't get, this, I can't get this damn thing fixed. Now, I don't think Barack Obama really should be worrying about the sidewalk in my front yard, right? Um, but my city council person should, and my mayor should. And these are the things that we ought to think of. But we're not there yet. And in order to get to that sort of distributed, you know, local democracy really working and being scalable, the first thing that we have to do is be able to name our city council person, or at least our representative member, at least some kind of local official, um, uh, which most of the people in this room, as we've seen, cannot do. Another, any other questions? Another question? Somebody? Yep, back there. Okay, so the question is, the, I used to work for a, for a government contractor, and whenever we wanted to use some kind of new tool or fancy process, um, the pushback we always got was security. Um, some convoluted argument about security. Now, security is important, um, uh, as the people over at Target can tell you. Uh, um, but the way that you beat convoluted closed systems is by opening up, right? And right now, our security practices, especially in the federal government, um, but also in state and local governments, are sort of convoluted and closed. For instance, in order to uh, capture what's considered personally identifiable information inside of a web application, you have to get uh, FISMA certification, FISMA moderate certification. Uh, usually you have to do that. Sometimes you don't if you're a social media service or whatnot. But, but if you're, you know, some kind of application, you have to get what's called FISMA uh, uh, moderate certification. Now, if you Google FISMA moderate, um, how do I get FISMA certification? Forget it. You're, you're done. You're done. Um, instead, what you need to do is basically pay a consultant to tell you how to do it. And an industry has, basically a closed industry has been set up in order to you know, run a racket on top of this stuff, and it's gross. And the way that we beat that is interesting. You know, I think that if the federal government said, hey, wait a minute, a good cybersecurity policy doesn't mean that we're going to keep, a good cybersecurity policy for the United States doesn't mean we're going to keep government systems secure. It means that we're going to make it so that systems in the United States are the most secure on the planet because it is our job to defend America from foreign bad guys. Um, and part of that job is defending our network and making sure that our entire network, the network that is in the United States, is secure. So what if instead of saying, how do I get FISMA status um, certification, let me go pay a $5,000 uh, consultant to get that for me. Um, what if instead of that we said, hey, the federal government is going to ensure that, 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 uh, that businesses in the United States are secure. And so as part of that, you can get a government certification that your website or your IT project is secure and government will give you a very low status of saying like you're probably pretty secure by you plug a URL in a box and some government computer out there does a vulnerability assessment on you, right? And then um, you, you, you get, you know, I, I understand that that's not all of security. I, I, I get that, but it's a small step. I, it's, I think it's a small step forward in not only creating a process that, uh, and you make that vulnerability ass assessment, of course, open, uh, open source as to how that vulnerability uh, uh, assessment is done. But, but that's a small step in making it so that we open up our security processes, but we also make it so that the entire web becomes more secure as a result of that legislation. That seems to me like it would make a lot more sense and have a lot more meaningful benefit for that $180 billion we, a year we spend on information technology. I got time for uh, probably one more question, judging from the rambliness of... Uh, of my answers. There's somebody pointing over in this direction. There, I can barely see you, so. 
Is there any hope in us doing what we did in Estonia? Uh, that would be rad, huh? I mean, part of the problem there is um, Estonia, Estonia's population is 1.6 million people. Um, it's less than the population of the city of the metro Atlanta region. Um, and so that's sort of, uh, I don't know whether it would scale or not. I think that, I mean, I think that that our government is going to have to make a choice. And, and the, the next president, not this president, because this president has you know, two years left, um, probably a little less than that if you, if you calculate the you know, sort of lame duckness part of the last, the last part of uh, a term. You know, generally, you just sort of check out for a little while. Um, uh, I, think, I think it's gonna be up for the next president to figure out whether or not that's realistic, and it's gonna be up to us as voters to really elevate the idea of a management agenda in the federal government and in local and state governments to a top tier issue. You know, we uh, as voters <clears throat> tend to break down into, into two parts. We say, well, America's this car sputtering down the road um, and in order to fix it, what we need to do is either, you know, um, uh, what the Democrats say is what we need to do is, is fill it up with more gasoline and what the Republicans say is we need to cut off half of the car um, and make it a lot smaller. Um, but no one's paying attention to the engine. Um, and I, I submit that we can't, really, we can't really move forward on any kind of program um, until we start paying attention to that engine um, and how that works, uh, how we hire people and how we hire contractors, um, and, uh, uh, and how we manage those contractors. So if we don't make, so the answer is uh, that's up to you. You have the power to figure that out. Um, if we as voters and we as engineers start saying, look, the management of government and, and government's acquisition of information technology is an issue that we care about as voters and we want to start asking our members of Congress and local city councilmen and, and all, those, all those, if we want to start asking that question at political events, then I think that we have a high probability of doing that. But if we want to continue to have the same old debate as to whether or not we put more gas in the engine or whether we make the car smaller, um, then we, we have no hope. Um, but I want to leave it on a bright note. Um, so thanks to Todd, to, to Todd for uh, having me here. Um, and thanks to you guys. These were great questions. I'm going to be somewhere upstairs uh, signing books if you want to hang out. You don't have to take a book if you don't want it. It's a good book. But um, uh, uh, So thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. <laughs>